Dying Light is an open-world zombie game that takes place in the city of Haran. One of my favorite things about Dying Light is the numerous weapons that you can find in the game, either by looting a friendly chest, completing a quest, or even crafting it yourself. They range from your regular old pipe to bladed weapons that are filled with every element imaginable. There are even guns that actually work unlike the game's predecessor. Today we see if you can beat Dying Light only using throwables. This includes objects such as molotovs, throwing stars, grenades, or even regular weapons should we be able to obtain the skill with the creative name of Melee Throw. One thing I will mention before we get into this is that I have not played Dying Light for a few years, and when I did, I only played it once. So when I say that I'm an inexperienced bottom who needs emotional support every 3 seconds, I mean it. Hopefully we can get past all of that adversity, and be able to come out on top. Maybe not as tops, but on top. Let's get this party started. In terms of the plot, I have absolutely no clue what the hell is going on. Like usual, I never paid attention to anything because I have ADHD and a rather unruly case of erectile dysfunction. My limited understanding is there is a virus, and we are here to exterminate it, like Mario and Goombas. Given that this is the first time this channel is featuring Dying Light, we will be taking things a little bit slower than usual, and really grind home that plot to the best of my ability. I guarantee that it'll still be wrong, but at least I could say that I took a stab at it unlike you when you said no to doing drugs. I just want you to know that I'm proud of you for doing the best you can do. Like any good action movie, we start off by jumping out of a plane with the song Free Falling by Tom Petty. Of course, I immediately get bitten. This is because I have so much blood raging through my body that the zombies are simply attracted to me above any others, like mosquitoes anytime I'm in a 5 mile vicinity of them. On the bright side, we get rescued by a very attractive woman that I won't make any jokes about because I'm not a misogynist. That said, I do like women, which I know is a crime in at least three countries. After having just played games that are not winning any awards for their graphics, this game is very attractive. So attractive that I had to take a break at this point and contemplate my life. Why are we even here? Did the chicken or the egg come first? Which kind of come are we talking about? Once inside the tower, I immediately start trying to find any shoes that have a powerful stench to them but unfortunately, I find none that are worthy of my time. Their scent is simply just not good enough, and I am built different. The amount of plants in this game makes me think of my first apartment. Everything is so pretty and I don't know what to do about it. I immediately got a really warm welcome, and found myself constantly wanting to interact with E instead of F, and this will undoubtedly cause my downfall throughout the rest of the game. I do have a sudden urge to push this guy off the edge, but unfortunately that would go against the nature of this challenge, as we can only use throwables which I know that I've mentioned 3 seconds ago, but I felt the need to mention it again just so I don't completely forget and accidentally murder somebody with a fart. We'll leave that for the toxic gas playthrough. Despite my namesake, I end up wandering around the hotel before I eventually find that there is another corridor that I completely missed, like the most imperceptionate avian that I am. I opened up a door into a perfectly working elevator, and this game immediately made me feel like a detective, and I want to pat it on the back. I love it when games don't have a glowing path beneath my feet telling me exactly where to go. We can't have things too easy after all. Just wanted to give a quick shout out to Fable 2 for being my childhood. I hope my horned demon with 9 families is doing well. Unfortunately, there was no baby for me to eat in this carriage, and we'll have to find a snack somewhere else. After a delectable phone call, I set off against the world, armed with only my pipe. As massive as it is, I am certainly scared as I grasp it firmly. Running into my first zombie, I'm not sure what I should do. I obviously need to find a way to kill it, but I don't have any way to kill it. Then I saw that I could kick, and I felt like Chuck Norris in my favorite film, Chuck Norris, The War for Femboys. Because of how stinky my feet are, I managed to kill it in one hit. I feel amazing, and very powerful. Though I had to fail this challenge almost immediately by using my foot, I find that this challenge is still viable. After all, without my feet I couldn't perform the numerous orgasms that I need to keep my discord alive. I have this cool new ability that allows me to see things that I've never seen before. I start to feel like Superman, invincible and all-powerful. While attempting to find gauze, I find everything but, including the same drink my grandpa would consume before he got angry and threw things at Kelly, my cat at the time. Rather than immediately healing the dying man after getting gauze, I continue looking for any sort of supplies. You may call me selfish, I call me efficient. Crafting a medkit and putting it on his arm, I immediately utilized all of my experience in the medical field. If you are interested in becoming a doctor in the upcoming apocalypse, just know that this is all they do. No assessment, just gauze. After spending 5 minutes wandering around the tower, I get back to Raheem and kiss him on the lips. Look at that chiseled jawline. Even the goggles remind me of Vin Diesel and Riddick, and that man is insanely beautiful. He wants me to get naked, so I start making my way up towards my bedroom in preparation for our event. 
Getting a nice warm up on the steps, I run upstairs to do some parkour. I feel like Neo from the Matrix, but at the same time I was also deathly afraid of heights at one point in my life. It's a good thing that this is a video game and fear does not translate at all. I certainly do not have my butt clenched or anything. Raheem kills himself and I do the same before I test out the abilities that I gain from said death. I crouch, run, and jump. Truly anything that a Discord moderator would not do. Despite none of this being particularly difficult, my screen suddenly goes green and I roleplay briefly as a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. Fortunately, with the screen more blurry than usual, I can't see the bottom or where I would fall. Returning to Raheem, he tells me to see a doctor. Before that, I need to get geared up. A table leg will suffice. It's actually a wrench and a table leg. Order now and you can receive a hug from your delivery man. You touch deprived animal. Because of the fact that this isn't as blinding as getting out of a vault, I feel like I am completely experienced and I don't need any advice or tutorials. Leaving one safety zone and entering another, I get to the doctor's trailer. This doctor is kind of cool because he reminds me of Doc Mitchell to a certain extent, outside of the hair and some other features. I introduce myself to Spike and he tells me about the issues that they've been experiencing with Antizen and how people keep stealing it. This is the only part of the plot that I really understood because it involved less than three words and he did really well summarizing it for my smooth brain. To start off, I specifically try to avoid any zombies because I don't really have a great way of killing them. I end up finding money and telephones, which I guess makes sense, but at the same time I was completely not expecting it. Looking at my skills, I find a perk that allows me to craft lockpicks, firecrackers, throwing stars, and molotovs. This will be a game changer for this run for obvious reasons. Now I just need to find how to craft these bad boys. It looks like blades, alcohol, and gauze are all going to be very important things for me. I managed to lockpick my first crate and get a pipe and some coffee. Of course, because of the fact that I'm a hoarder, I already cannot pick up the pipe. A lot of looting will be done off camera just to save you guys all from the mental strain of watching Owl for an extended period of time, and because I don't want to provide you with that sort of commentary. I get kind of weird when I'm left to my thoughts for way too long if you haven't already put that together. Dismantling some gear unfortunately does not give me everything I need, so I'm still looking for string. Why I can't rip off my t-shirt and become a hot, sweaty boy, I don't know. On the bright side, it prevents me from being demonetized by YouTube because I am a good boy. My first zombie, well, we're not going to count the first one. We're going to count this one as the first one because he goes down like a charm with weapons that are actually valid for this run. I actually really like these strobles, they're very attractive, like you. Grabbing a few supplies and answering another phone call, I set out for the next mission. I continuously prepare more traps by utilizing molotovs and firecrackers. I do pretty well, but the zombies are of course always on my tail. Fortunately, I am able to dodge them effectively like the slippery, well lubed thin boy that I am. At one point I ran into an issue that I didn't have any throwables, so I decided to throw a propane tank and it killed the walker. I'm not sure whether this fails the challenge or not, but I threw it, so it's a throwable. I then proceeded to use this way too much because the sound it makes is beautiful. I made this jump on the first try, and I am very proud of that interaction. Returning back to Spike, he seems to have gotten much cooler. I don't know whether he did his hair differently or not, but it definitely looked cute. Maybe more spikiness. He also seemed upset, and when my friends are upset, I have to pet them, so I do just that. It doesn't seem to help, unfortunately. I actually climbed up a pole, and I'm not sure what to do with my life at this point. On the bright side, I've got some massive veins, which I should be able to utilize to obtain any busty nurse. Sarah, I'm looking at you. Grabbing this stuff from the quartermaster, I head back upstairs and do some trading. Brecken seems like he's in a bad place. Perhaps I can give him a massage or something, but unfortunately before I get to know him well, I'm sent off on another mission after only receiving a handshake. I guess first base will have to wait. Would one of you mind outlining what the bases are? Because everywhere I look, I get different results, and I need something definitive. Before heading out on Brecken's mission, I have another phone call. My vision goes blue as I remember a time from my childhood. We used to take recess as soon as we got down with lunch. So often, we would run out to the playground as soon as we finished our trays and sit by the edges of the rocks. There we started a colony. This colony wasn't purposeful like most. It was abstract, more of an idea than anything. We would grab different sticks, stones, pieces of grass, and leaves. Anything that we could get our hands on. I would say that there were probably four or five of us grabbing different supplies each day. We'd rotate positions. One person would be the builder, one person would be the planner, etc. It was therapeutic, in a way, similar to Japanese peace gardens. Of course, you'd have those days when we'd come back to our colony and see that it was destroyed by either a lawnmower or a vile individual 
destined for a life full of sorrow. But it was in those moments that we found redemption, for them and for ourselves. We didn't seek vengeance. We sought a way to better ourselves, to better the colony. So we would come back and build it better. We'd add defenses to the walls, even makeshift catapults that of course didn't work, but in our imaginative minds they would set free rocks on our enemies should we obtain any. We were free. I suppose I tell you this story now because the freedom that I feel in this game is unlike any that I've ever really experienced. Being able to just climb anywhere that you wish, do pretty well anything, and utilize various surroundings around you. The way that everything is built, the architecture of the buildings themselves, the city itself is miraculous, and it reminds me of those small wooden structures built on the side of the playground. And that's really what Dying Light is, a playground. In that exposition, all that you really missed was me dying a few times and realizing that humans are going to be the bane of my existence. Them being able to deflect almost every single throwable object that I have at my disposal, I resorted to crafting multiple Molotovs to get rid of them. Hopefully in the future I can find some way of expediting the process of killing them, or having more resources to play with, but in the meantime we've got a new problem on our hands. We need to collect an airdrop full of Antizen. Unfortunately, the first one we check is empty, but just as we finish checking it, two more airdrops were made. The first one, Rice already had his men in it, so I ended up sprinting to the other location to see if we could get that one instead. As night begins to set and I run past a goon, tensions begin to rise. You get it, rise, because, you know, it's rise. The smoke from the flare fills my vision and it isn't long before I craft some more firecrackers and molotovs to be able to dispatch the zombies inside. On the bright side, this time around we do have Anderson. On the downside, the evil lady in my ear tells me to destroy it all, and night sets as I hear the screams of volatiles dancing through the alleyways. When I say that my butt was buckered, I mean to tell you that I am absolutely terrified and have no clue how to do anything anymore. Volatiles are the most terrifying thing ever, and the chase felt crazy, but fortunately I was able to get back to the tower relatively unscathed. And by joining the orgy of people discussing what to do, I convinced the team that my butt is ready for action. Brecken shows me the details, and I ready the lube. If our prior interaction with bandits and humanoids have any semblance of comparison to what is ahead of us, we're going to need a lot of it. Introducing myself to Alfie, I obtained another quest of being able to reorientate the power from being a bottom to a top. That way we can fill all the holes in the Discord server. The link is in the description if you want a cool place to show pictures of your doggos, spiders, or cats. The quest starts off being a little bit rough, but after being able to sneak inside one of our already existing safe houses that we were very intelligent enough to be able to procure before the whole situation, things were made a little bit easier. Spike is more than happy enough to be able to give me some supplies and snag a little bit of a rest so that we can once again wait until night and run over to the power station to flip the breaker. I really thought that this was going to kill all the zombies in the area for some odd reason, as was previously discussed in the quest reveal, but they look pretty alive to me, all things considered. I'm all for trying new things, but electricity was really not my cup of tea. It just kind of left me feeling dehydrated, and even less of a person than what I was before. At this point, I really just needed supplies, so I went around and scavenged as much as what I could. I did run into some of Rice's men at one point and used a Molotov. I'm not sure if it was really the best use of my time or my resources, but it was fun, and it happened. Outside of that, I did try to look in the bus, although that proved to be rather dangerous as multiple runners decided to seek me out and ask for my number. I was flattered at first, but after a while it grew cumbersome, and I actually ended up running out of throwables. Running out of throwables means that I've got no real ways of attacking, which if you don't know, is a bad thing. Heading inside of Rice's base, I find myself absolutely surrounded by enemies. If I had to tackle all these, I would die so many times that it's unbelievable. How is that for foreshadowing? Rice seems pretty cool, but I definitely think he should go back to kindergarten considering that he doesn't know his right from his left. I absolutely love though that you could pick up the weapon that he used to cut off the guy's hand, and the fact that the hand is still there. It's just, I don't know, it's remarkable, and I just want to dabble a little bit of yellow blood all over my forehead to truly say what type of person I am here, and join the rest of the crowd. Cream inside told me to revisit Far Cry, and climb all the telephone towers that I could. Outside of that though, he was pretty cool. Stepping outside to take an important phone call, I meet a zombie who really just doesn't want to have anything to do with me. Goodbye, have a good life. While on the way to the telecommunication antenna, I took out a bunch of zombies at one of the safe houses so that I could have a little bit of extra cushion to know that when I die, I will spawn relatively close to the area. It's definitely an interesting outlook on life, planning one's own downfall, but one that I will try to follow for the rest of the game. 
When I step inside, I do get a little bit overwhelmed, but I'm able to flip off the switch and of course get grabbed. It definitely sucks that I can't punch these guys, but in comparison to the other runs I've seen, it doesn't happen to me nearly as much as everyone else. That's on trust issues. Coming back from the dead, I'm able to climb up the tower after so many butt clenches and realize that the tower had already been dismantled, thus being unusable for Kareem's task. I really wish that there was some sort of a bolt cutter set that we could use to make this whole process easier, but we can't have that because it's a video game, right? Rice gets close enough to kiss me, and I talk with Kareem. I have another phone call with my girlfriend from prison, do some quick looting and trading, and investigate the fishing town here, which actually didn't go too bad with some well-placed firecrackers and Molotovs. It did get a little bit messy when a bloater decided to poop on my face. I mentioned my confliction about scat before, but I think this time around I'm going to take a hard pass. I got the goods from the fisherman's leader before grabbing the most useful perk in this entire run. Being able to throw standard weapons and not regular throwables allows us to technically circumvent the throwable only part of this challenge, and utilize real weapons while throwing them, thus making them still throwing weapons. If you didn't follow any of that, you can blame Owl because he doesn't know how to talk. This perk is a blessing and a sense of bliss just filled my body as I realized that this run may actually be doable without having to shave my head and murder the cashier at 7-Eleven. I buy some more goods from the fairy shop and talk to Morgan. One of the things that I really like about the quest system in this game, outside of it being kind of a point and click, hey, go here, go here, is the way that Crane reacts to the situation like he genuinely doesn't want to do this. Like he doesn't want to rob people of their only life. You can see the way that he shifts from being a passive individual to a much more aggressive one as he tries to balance his relationship with Rise and Brecken. Grabbing some shut eye at a new safe house, I start making my way back. Rise, of course, gives us the detour of dealing with the well bunkered down guy with the assault rifle. I watched enough of these playthroughs to know that a Molotov is the best way to deal with these guys without having access to guns. One big boom later, I grab the envelope and clear out another safe house. At this point, I was feeling pretty good about securing a location and just playing the game naturally. But not having access to guns will definitely come back to bite me in the butt later on. Turning in the envelope to Kareem, I step inside to talk to Rise, where he unfortunately gives me only 5 vials instead of the original 2 crates. This makes me upset and I want to yell at him, but unfortunately he has a loaded gun and I only have throwing weapons. I mean look at that thing, that's a big gun. Much bigger than mine, that's for sure. Heading back inside the tower and grabbing the things from the quartermaster, I find out that there is an outbreak on the 18th floor and head over to the elevator. I hand off the supplies to Jade, buy a few more supplies, and check in with Brecken. He seems like he's in a bad place, one where people stare at television screens. I take that back, one where people punch television screens. He seems like he's in a really bad place, and I want to be empathetic. I want to look into his eyes and kiss his lips as I take my thumb and dance across his little bit of stubble, but unfortunately I have yet another quest to do. I turned in the gun that I had gotten from the police vehicle and headed to the roof. Why everybody in this game has to be super attractive, I don't know, but just know that the energy in the studio today is feeling romantical. Romantical, that is, until I call my girlfriend again. She makes me feel upset spaghetti, but then I meet up with Jade who wants to steal a bunch of Anazin from Rise himself. Before beginning the next main quest, I get a little bit of looting done at the pawn shop from the gunslinger quest and die a handful of times. I definitely don't like tight spaces, which is surprising because I don't mind butt stuff. I met with Jade in the boxcar. I wish we would have spent more time in this dark place together, but I guess the eye candy will just have to suffice. The way that she pushes me down to the ground fills me with an energy that I simply cannot contain. After a short break, I'm back at the action, where we have the opportunity to meet and to hear one of Rice's main men. He seems pretty okay, but I'd rather just not meet him at all, because tall males scare me. I'm 1 foot 8 by the way, or 50 centimeters for the superior parts of the world. When the front door doesn't work, always try the back door, as long as you have consent. Trying to finger the door a little bit, it proves uneventful, and no give is received. After spending a lot of time trying to get to the roof, I end up getting on top, and things get a little bit crazy. Me not being the one that's very experienced with being at top, I find myself overwhelmed. People were all around me, clinging to me when all of a sudden something inside me just snapped, and I realized that I was built different. I started taking down people's numbers like I was actually a cool, confident guy. Once inside with most of my resources depleted, I rested a little bit taking my eyes away from the computer and appreciating how beautiful life was. I say it was because this area made me rethink my entire life. Before we get to that though, I do want to celebrate with you my sudden realization that I could craft exploding throwing stars. Being able to unlock that recipe prevented me from needing to use string, meaning that I could use all the other stuff that I collected this entire run 
I make 56 throwing stars. In addition, I make several medkits just because I figured that I would probably die multiple times and that maybe if I could heal, I could prevent that. That's Owl using his big brain. Stepping inside the school, I began pushing furniture. I had honestly considered getting a job here as a janitor, but they didn't pay well enough and the benefits were absolutely trash. On the bright side, I was going to get free oral, whatever that means. The guards and zombies fortunately didn't prove too damaging to my beautiful face. I utilized explosive stars to stagger my enemies and combined it with a one-two punch with my blades from the CDC approved distance. I also paid my respects to Harambe, an elephant, and a giraffe. How these guys are able to successfully block all my thrown weapons, I don't know, but it's a power that I hope to achieve one day. I used way more throwing stars than what I had really wanted in this particular area, but I didn't have access to any of my other weapons, which made me upset. I feel so good about relaying my emotions to you peeps. It really lets you know how impactful these challenge runs are on my life. If you'd like my suffering to continue, and me to be able to keep making these videos, consider supporting my Patreon using the link below. Not only would this make you even more cute, but you'd also have access to early ad-free videos and know what runs I have planned in advance. Opening the door to the basement and heading downstairs, I realized that somebody peed a lot. The basement is completely flooded. Fortunately, I know a man who would be willing to drink all of it. Meeting up with Jade, I find that it is not Antizen in the container, and instead, it was plastic explosives. I know I mentioned it before, but she's really attractive. I love females in video games, as it really shows their power. Imagine 2v wanting a guy, and he just starts throwing shovels at you. Like, how terrified would you really be? Heading back to the tower and continuing the gunslinger quest, I found out that the guy who I had given the gun to had ran away with his son. I try to give him a call, but unfortunately, he hangs up. Perhaps one day I will be able to find him and his son, but this will be the last time we hear of them this playthrough due to Owl being completely fed up with this run when that time rolls around. Until then, we need to talk to Raheem on the roof. Raheem wants to blow up the volatile nest, but due to the information that we got from Jade, we're not supposed to let him. We've got to do it ourselves. Taking ourselves over to Zaheer to get information on the new infected, we learn that they are named Bolters and that they only appear at night. Since we appreciate the interrogatory system as much as any doctor, we're going to need to collect some tissue samples from said bolter. But the only way we could do that is by going to the quartermaster and seeing which locations it has frequented. Before we get too far there with the main quest line, we do need to go and do a couple side quests because we need better stuff. I'm not sure what exactly because I haven't played this game recently, but I feel like we've been struggling a little bit too much, even for a challenge run. The first quest I decided to do is to find the glasses and the gardening book for Kalik. They're hoping to start gardening on the roof, so hopefully this will give them a little bit of an advantage. I would take the time to talk about the amazing books that I found here, but I'm afraid that this video is already going to be longer than my grandpa's sack. The next side quest that I end up doing is the Gassed Up quest. It involves talking with Commander Jeff and turning a few valves. The first valve goes relatively decently after I sprint away from all the enemies, but the second one I end up running across the first goon that I thought I would have to kill. Fortunately, I'm able to use a little bit of strategy, climb up on the bridge, loop around and jump down with a firecracker, being able to have just enough time to turn the valve. The final valve was inside of the tunnel, which made it a little bit tricky as there were quite a few zombies inside. I was able to craft a new type of throwing star, the fire kind. I actually kind of like these more than the exploding ones simply because they were able to interact with the environment more and that they seemed like they did a lot more damage. For being in such a sticky situation, I managed to come out on top, unlike usual. I did get a little bit sidetracked with some firecrackers and some molotovs when there were hordes of zombies nearby, but that's to be expected. After all, it is a zombie game. The last part of this quest was completely different than the first three. There were so many zombies there that I thought I needed to clear out to get inside of the single room there, but in reality all I needed to do was swim inside a nearby pipe. To be able to deal with the goon inside, again I used a firecracker strategy and quickly turned the valve. Because things can't be too simple, I then needed to turn three more valves when there were a bunch of runners chasing after me. The intensity that this game continuously shows scares the crap out of me. It definitely doesn't ever let you think that you're overpowered this early on, and there's a great progression system, even with this weird challenge going on. Returning back to Jeff, I may accidentally have brought upon his demise, but I'm pretty sure his own stupidity did it for me. Who puts their milk in before their cereal? Either way, it was a cool explosion, and I'm content that I did the quest. Wanting to swap back over to the main quest, I rest up at the safe house and start heading towards the bolter nest. The first one didn't go very well, just because of the fact that I had to run away and the bolter tissue despawned. But the second time, a little bit further away, I had to crap while I was doing it, 
like I was on the toilet, playing with a wireless monitor and a set of peripherals. The turd was halfway through, and just as I was running into the night, it all just rushed out in that moment because there was so much going on. Due to my high fiber diet, I was able to successfully get away and get back to Zahir. Just after stepping outside of Zahir's trailer, we learned that Amir planted the charges in the volatile's nest, despite us telling him not to. Things went bad and Amir and Omar went near the train yard to bunker down. On the way there, I ended up dancing around a little bit with a friendly runner and got to realize that I still in fact know the electric slide. After dealing with the zombies in the train yard, a toad appears. I take him out with a couple throwing weapons, of all things, I know. Amir, for whatever reason, decided to arm the explosives. This leaves us roughly three minutes to run through the sewers and plant the bomb at the volatile's nest. The first one goes relatively okay, but things get a little bit crowded on the second one. I ended up dodging enemies like I do with questions relating to my sexuality to get away from the grabbers before planting the explosives with the aid of a firecracker. Watching the amazing display of demolition genius, I swim back through the sewers and see that Rahim is turned. Snapping his neck, I failed the challenge for like the 15th time this run. Heading back to the tower and finishing up the glasses and gardening book quest, I go to have a conversation with Brecken. Unfortunately, Jade walks in on our top secret conversation, meaning that she already knows that Amir is dead. A giant explosion happens and the medical area is under attack. I'm not sure by what at this point, but when I get there I realize that it's Ryze's men wanting to get the research. I ended up accidentally spamming all of my Molotovs and unironically it seemed to do the trick. Zaheer was taken and I needed to go back to Ryze's headquarters to try to retrieve him. Stinking around the side because the main entrance was locked, I ended up walking straight into an ambush. It turns out that you shouldn't bring a knife to a gunfight. Who would have known? The second time around goes better, but unfortunately I ended up happening to use like 10 throwing stars for each guy. It's definitely a resource heavy area, that's for sure. Once I got on the roof it became a lot easier because the enemies didn't have guns. It was actually kind of enjoyable at this point, being able to dodge so effectively. But the enemies still were able to deflect quite a few of my weapons, meaning I ended up playing a game of pickup the majority of the time. I'm sure they liked the view. I had a phone call with our new husband and we found out that they were going to carpet bomb the area in a matter of 48 hours. Because this is a video game, we can pretend that this arbitrary amount of time has no control over how much we do side quests and sleep. To balance the odds against these new enemies, we're going to be crafting a bunch of grenades from the new perk that we were able to obtain. Sliding down an elevator shaft, I do try to be a little bit sneaky, but of course that goes as well as what you'd expect from someone carrying multiple firearms and various pipes. Despite that little bit of a hiccup, we got a good use of the grenades and they do pretty well. Really when the enemies are one on one, it's not so bad, but as soon as we run out of weapons, then we have to rely on throwables quite extensively. Fortunately, we were able to do quite a bit of looting here and grab various military throwing knives. I can definitely appreciate the fact that the game rewards you for exploring as much as what it does. Just having a crap ton of assault rifles and guns would make this game a lot more fun, especially considering that firearms up until this point weren't very common. We'll have to leave that for another run because we've got some people to murder. I do learn my lesson pretty quickly here that the guards are not as stupid as zombies and the fact that firecrackers do not work as well as what you'd hope. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, this area was not as fun as the rest of the game has been. Dying light is fortunately very forgiving in the sense that if you do kill somebody, they don't come back after you die, so you don't have to repeat the entire zone again. This guy was so powerful that he just straight up disappeared. Majestic, like a flying eagle or a breedable owl. I can't even aim, apparently because of the fact that porta potties are essentially indestructible, so hiding behind them is a solid move even if half of your body is showing. To get through this area, I had to use every aspect of the environment that I could find. Igniting propane tanks, being able to pick up a melee weapon and throw it right back at another enemy, and using so many shuriken was what got me through this area. After rescuing the doctor, Ryze appeared out of absolutely nowhere, which was super cool and kind of hot to be honest with you. Something that was less hot was when he stabbed the doctor and knocked me out. At the mention of the pit, I readied my nose so that I could get as many sniffs in as possible. Ryze helps me take down some of his own men and I am put into a pit very similar to a Borderlands arena before immediately dying. It was remarkable and very painstaking watching this process happen multiple times. I end up dancing around the arena for a little bit maybe killing 5 before dying, which is rather despicable, but that is going to be the going rate unless somehow I'm able to be smarter, be better. I am sure that there is nothing that will make this situation more difficult. I did run into something that I wish I would have found out earlier in the run, because I might have had the opportunity to figure out why or how that it would interact with this challenge. So if you hit a propane tank with a melee weapon, it ends up getting to the point where it explodes, right? But technically I'm not hitting anything except for the propane tank, so I'm not actually doing any damage technically. You could argue that I'm using a melee weapon to break the tank, but I'm the biggest bird here, and I make the rules. 
Remember when I mentioned a moment ago that things couldn't get worse? I was wrong. A demolisher chases after me as Rise is eager to kill me. My first bit of damage was done by just a propane tank that was being thrown, but it didn't do very much damage. I also tried to throw a sledgehammer at it, and it did such a minuscule amount of damage that I want to cry. I'm not sure why I started being able to do so much damage, but I believe that it was because I was able to hit where there wasn't any armor. Regardless, it makes me happy, and I feel a lot less like crying right now. Despite this, I died, but when the demolisher didn't regenerate all of his health, I knew that this was totally doable. Fortunately, I was able to take down all the runners before I was able to focus on the demolisher. On the bright side, I did get a very fancy axe from it that I will probably use one time. I failed the challenge again in a cutscene multiple times when I didn't use throwables. Zaheer died and I was forced to run through a gauntlet as Ryze's men shot at me. Because of the fact that I am either bulletproof or so agile that you couldn't even catch me, I was able to get through the gauntlet on the first try. I've mentioned multiple times now that I'm built different, but I feel like now is a good time to mention that I'm just a bottom trying to find sweet, sweet love on the internet. As soon as I got out of the hellhole that reminded me of the Warthog run, I started turning into a turtle again. My vision started turning green, but Brecken was able to save me and get me back into a shipping container, that way we could go to Japan and eat noodles while getting shredded. Then a cool guy who would be willing to take me inside of his pipe spoke to me with his delicate voice, and I started heading in that direction. Once getting inside of the tunnel, I had this eerie feeling that I was going to die, but I was able to get through fine with some firecrackers. Asan has my bodyguard for this trip, and he has a pretty cool style about him. I'm not sure about the guns, though, because I'm kind of role-playing as a crippled Batman this run. Stepping inside the sewers, I'm not sure exactly how a kid is supposed to do what I just did, but we'll see. You never know, maybe he'll get bit by a spider and be able to throw webs everywhere. Using some more firecrackers, I'm able to get past all the zombies and what I believe to be a drainage tunnel. I really think it would have been fun to kill them all with a bunch of bullets, but the grass is always less irradiated on the other side. My firecrackers don't do as well this time around, and I die almost immediately. I'm not sure why sometimes they go after them and then sometimes they don't, but it obsesses me a great deal because now I have to go all the way back at the very beginning of this entire section. This entire area was a maze, and I didn't really like it. I think having actual equipment in this area as well as the grappling hook is a must for you to enjoy it, but after a few deaths, I get through just fine. Sliding my way into combat, I managed to die again. This is getting a little bit old, but I unfortunately think that this is how the rest of the game is going to go. It seems like for every guy I end up killing, I end up dying. Modern Warfare players are quaking in their thigh highs right now, even thinking about my KD. In hindsight, I probably should have stocked up on medical supplies before making the journey through a zombie-infested area. Eventually, I'm able to clear them all out and head through the next tunnel. Because the developers knew that I was going to be doing this challenge and suffering a great deal on this particular tunnel, they decided to put a bunch of crates full of goodies as a way of saying, I'm sorry I twisted your DNA like a kitten with a ball of yarn. Shout out to the love of my life, more brown from Fallout 3. And the next area, equally as deadly. I try to use some altovs and some throwing knives, but it just doesn't cut it. Honestly, I think that they seem to be completely immune to fire because at this point none of my weapons are igniting them. Maybe he's just having a good day, and if that's the case, good for him, you know? Heading outside and into the new area, I immediately am welcomed by an amazing view. Doing a little bit of trading, I realize that if I'm going to be successful in my mission to beat this game, I need to stock up on resources, and a lot of them. Before that though, I do need to die. One of the great aspects about this area in particular is the fact that all the buildings are usually 3-4 to four stories, meaning that if you happen to miss a jump, you are dead, no if and buts about it. It took a little bit of time, clearing out the safe houses to the best of my ability, making sure that when I do die, I've got spots to respawn. Unfortunately, looting in this game is time consuming, and it's not really entertaining with repetitively having to lockpick chests while still not getting the resources that you need. This makes it a little bit difficult to keep your weapons up when you're only using throwables. Because of that and my desire to finish this challenge as quickly as I can, I end up skipping past a lot of loot, and instead just going straight for the main quest. Sure, this will come back to bite me in the butt later on, but for right now, it'll be just fine. While at this cute lady's place, we learn that Jade still has the research and doesn't want to see us, but is at least alive and that we can find her at the university. On the way there, I do a little bit more looting despite what I just mentioned in the hopes of being able to save all the throwables that I possibly can. Getting to the museum and talking with the guy, he tells me that Jade was here, but of course this is a video game and we are told to go back to the place that we are just at, so back to the tower we go. We see a news broadcast that reflects what we had learned earlier about them wanting to blow up the city. In turn, we need to set up explosives because that's the next logical thing to let them know that there are still people in Haran. This communication system reminds me of how I communicate with my parents. 
one of the things I'm seeing now, either because we are a higher level or because of the fact that we are in this new area, is that these containers are starting to hold a lot more military throwing knives. This makes my job a little bit easier, but also encourages me to loot more and forces me to retract upon how upset I was moments ago about not being able to find what I need. Heading into the sewers, I push through all the turds and pieces of corn. Here I spend most of my time running past the zombies, rather than fighting them again, trying to save resources. I almost turned into a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle again, but fortunately I'm able to keep my head together and avoid growing a shell. Talking with Michael, I grab the explosives and a couple extra pieces of gear before hopping on an elevator and reaching the ninth floor. Here I need to place a bunch of explosives on stoves. I'm almost positive that this is what they mean by cooking with gas. I'll be honest with you, it doesn't go very well. I die a couple times, and by a couple, I mean an absolute orgy of death. The only things that proved to be a consistent saving grace were fire throwing stars, and being able to pull a walking dead card by being able to camouflage with zombie guts. Grabbing the detonator because Michael wasn't able to, I step outside and watch as we form a smiley face with the explosives. Unfortunately, this doesn't take, as a jet sends missiles down upon it to blow up the fancy emoji explosion. Jade gets back in contact with me and forgives me for all the damages that I've done with the condition that I'm able to contact the GRE. Unfortunately, as I go to meet her, Jade is stolen by Rice. This means that we're going to have to attack Rice's main headquarters, which I thought we already did. It turns out he has two main headquarters. As someone who doesn't have a main headquarter, I feel left out. Because of this and the fact that I hadn't really had the opportunity to get very many throwables, I decided to see if an idea that popped in my head a little while ago would work. Being able to sleep through the night would bypass the 24 hours that you would need to wait for vendors to reset. So essentially, by sleeping twice in a row, you can reset the vendors, meaning that now with our $23,000 sum, we can buy pretty well anything, including throwing knives. Now this is tedious, but it's worth it. Logically, this would mean that the Ministry has enough time to blow us all to high hell, but this is a video game, and we get to appreciate the ability to time skip without the thought of death. I do this little loop until I have over 100 throwing knives, a bunch of molotovs, and a bunch of grenades. After all that grinding, and not the kind that you usually do on a dance floor, I ended up meeting with the curator of the museum. The museum is where Rice is holding Jade. His bright suggestion is that we grow gills and learn how to breathe underwater. Skipping my way right over, I test Crane's lung capacity. Fortunately, it isn't too long of a swim, and I am inside Rice's compound before I know it. I'm not sure if these bodies inside were supposed to attack me, but I'm sure glad that they didn't. After a little bit of a swim and more parkour, I fight two men with nothing but some throwing stars. While I wish that this was the hardest section of the compound, it certainly wasn't. This next little section is a little bit more tricky than the previous one. I'm able to strategically take out the guys in the lower level, but the guys on the upper level were so tough that even with using multiple Molotovs, they still got the better of me. Fortunately, I was able to get away from here with only one death and push into the next area. Again, using all the Molotovs, grenades, and throwing knives that I could possibly muster. Definitely glad that I farmed the store for all the knives and supplies required to keep up this expensive playstyle. I actually started to enjoy this next area simply because of how prepared I was. Being able to throw a bomb, switch to a Molotov, and toss a throwing knife to finish off the guy who's just suffered a massive amount of burning. It was all a very seamless and fun encounter despite the difficulty. In addition, I was sure to pick up all the rifles, that way I could sell them. Each one of those bad boys is about a thousand apiece or more, meaning that I could buy even more throwing knives should I get the opportunity. Something kind of funny happens here as I end up falling off the parkour section and into the pit of the zombies below, so I head to retreat, doing a bunch of dancing to be able to get back up on the ledge and heal up. Charging forward, I am able to point blank throw knives at my targets. Being able to generate enough power to actually do damage is hilarious, and shows how hot Crane really is, especially since I don't have the perk that allows you to do double the damage with throwing weapons. That comes at level 9, which hopefully we get here before too long. After clearing out the zombies, leveling up, and seeing Jade, we watch a cutscene and learn that Jade was bitten. We then go through a Dishonored, Assassin's Creed, and Fallout styled cutscene, and end up getting the antizen shot instead of Jade. This causes her to go all Kung Fu Panda on all the enemies, and I find myself still appreciating that fine piece of ass, even as she goes insane. Just as we snap Jade's neck to hear the cute but scary tall guy from earlier in the story says hello. If you were to click on this video with curiosity and want to know the hardest part about this entire challenge, it is this single fight. Stripped of all of our belongings, we have two weapons to kill to here. He isn't much stronger than your average Joe, but his stunning beauty would leave any femboy unable to walk the next morning. 
That, combined with my inability to actually hit him due to his insane deflection abilities and his extra goons of the human variety, made this fight a living hell. Only one time in my life reminded me of this moment. High school love is a certain kind of love. Not only are most people at that time an experience with romance, but lonely in general. High school is a time where everything in terms of your personality is uncertain. You don't know who you need to be yet. It was at that time in my life that I met a wonderful girl. Blonde, a bit shorter than me, blue eyes, fit, but most importantly, she was smart. As someone who has always been a bit smart in the sense of school, I always had a sucker for women who are good at solving problems, but she especially blew me away. Ava was cold one day in class and had said as much just as I had taken off my sweatshirt. Me being the kind person that I was, I let her borrow it and didn't think much about it. She asked at the end of class if I wanted it back and I told her that she could hang on to it until the next day, just in case she got cold in one of her other classes. The next day in the same class, Ava gave me my sweatshirt back with a giant smile on her face. If I was perceptionate, I would have noticed that there was something a little bit more about that smile that was different than usual. The way her eyes curled up just a little bit more, her pupils dilated, or her hand immediately fumbling to her hair as she sat down. It wasn't until that night, as I was doing laundry, that I instinctively checked the front pocket for pens, that I had found a folded sheet of notebook paper. On it, in the most smooth handwriting that I've ever seen, was, I thought you were cute. Call me. Followed by her number and name. Up until that point, I hadn't thought of my classmates as anything more than friends. My mindset was entirely on school. Not women after a previous relationship ended poorly, but we'll save that story for another time. As I read the note with her number on it for the fifth time, I saw the immediate attraction. She was perfect in every sense of the word. Or so I thought. I called her that night and we talked every day for six months. We started slowly, then gradually picked up with the flirting and serious discussions about life. If you've always been curious about where I picked up my sometimes disturbing humor, it was her. She was a tease, but the relationship was built on knowledge and deep thinking rather than pure lust. It was when that communication that I had found myself falling in love with disappeared suddenly that I was heartbroken. As soon as she cut contact, I never spoke with her again. Sure, I'd see her in class, but not another word was shared. I turned to school and exercise as methods of coping. My grades improved, and I grew stronger and faster. I'd gotten as close to perfect as I could have gotten. You may be toying around in your head about how the story got started. Or if you weren't paying attention, perhaps you were completely lost and don't see what I'm saying. But regardless, the hell that I mentioned that I went through wasn't losing Ava. It was forgiving her. For about a year, I held a hatred in my heart for her. She was perfect for me, and I was perfect for her. In reality, there is no such thing as perfect, and the relationship had flaws. Sure, they could have been fixed, but we never had that opportunity. It is in that hatred that I lost myself. I had no clue who I was anymore and wanted to give up. I had no friends or people who understood me. I tell you this story not to bank on you being my therapist, but to tell you to forgive those people in your life who you feel have hurt you. I know it is always going to be hard. And some people don't deserve your forgiveness. But there is no harm in trying. And try is what I did. I fought to here for half an hour before I finally killed all of his ghouls with only the throwable perk. It was a difficult fight, but one that left me feeling content with just how far I had come. These two guys outside really didn't make my life very easy. I ended up having to throw so many weapons, and when that didn't work, I ended up finding out that my stash was just right next to them. With that information, I was able to heal up and deal with them with some throwing weapons that are now superior thanks to that handy little perk that we picked up. Linking back up with Troy, she tells me that I need to go to the very top of the antenna outside of town to be able to make sure that the signal that they were able to create is boosted. So much stuff is happening in the plot right now that I can't even pay attention to it. I'm used to highly stimulating games like Minecraft and Tetris. Heading into the sewers, I get completely overwhelmed. It is so easy to die in this game after just taking the wrong turn which is oddly fitting for the apocalypse. After the long walk back, I managed to make it inside, turn some valves, loot a little bit, do some running in the dark, and make it outside. I end up needing to look for a keycard for a little bit, but it isn't long before I dance around a whole bunch of zombies, flip a switch, and climb a giant tower. 
The tower was definitely not easy to climb, and the zombies up top made me never want to eat again with how bad my hemorrhoids are getting. Getting up top, I secure Haran from being blown up. I then need to head through the tunnel to get to Old Town. This is actually a really fun encounter again, because we've got to go through a night run where volatiles were kind of chasing us, and my butt was clenched for sure. While on the way to Camden's lab, I revisited Assassin's Creed. Got surprised by a guy who I thought was supposed to be friendly, realized that I was completely out of throwables, and stocked up on resources. This area is your typical break into a lab situation and nothing crazy happens. To start your engines, because we're about to blast our way through to the finish line. I burn a couple guys, get in the nicest elevator that I've ever seen outside of the ones that are in the TV show Arrow starring Stephen Amell, set some zombies on fire, climb through a vent, got a nice little jump scare, threw a crap ton of ninja stars, got reminded of Left for Dead, started the generator, got tossed around a little bit like the majority of my dates, awkwardly stared at a doctor while he administered my prostate exam, ran back to the facility, had a talk with Rise, and began the game's finale. While I run through the last of Rise's gauntlets, I'd like to take the time to give my overall opinions of the game itself, and of course this run. Perhaps one of the best parts about this game is the chase sequences. Not only is there a sense of urgency unlike anything that I've ever felt, but you get to utilize the absolutely amazing parkour movements. This furthered even more by the end of the game as you've unlocked better abilities and faster modes of transportation. I know I blew through the last portion of the game, but quite honestly, story-wise, it was rather mediocre. Once we got to the pits, everything felt relatively similar to the earlier parts of the game. That said, there were some quests that I missed out on, and like the stereotype of books being better than movies, oftentimes the game's side quests are more enjoyable than the main quest. Regardless of my somewhat constant negativity regarding this game, I absolutely loved it. The gameplay was fun and original while reminding me of all my favorite games, from Ratchet and Clank to Assassin's Creed Revelations. In terms of this challenge specifically, I actually had a lot of fun. The first time I played through this game a few years ago, I had no idea about grenades or elemental throwing stars. Not only that, I never really threw my weapons because I was scared of losing them. This time around, I had to be willing to let go of everything to succeed. I wasn't able to appreciate unique weapons and had to utilize common weapons for the majority of the game. The worst parts about this run surrounded not being able to actually hit things, enemies deflecting at least half of your throwables, and not being able to actually fight zombies that grabbed onto you. All of that said, I'm definitely interested in doing some more challenge runs of this game, so let me know if you have any more in the comments. Just as I kill Rise, after way more times than I am going to admit to all of you, I fail the challenge again, proving that no, you can't be dying light with only throwables. If you guys enjoyed the video, make sure you check out another one here. As always, thank you to my patrons. I can't put enough emphasis on how much you guys mean to me. Thank you. With all that being said, I've been Owl, but do me a favor, will ya? Have a good one.